Good morning and welcome to Worship at Trinity. We are glad you are here today and we are glad to gather in the name of the Lord. As we begin, if you'll join me in looking at a few announcements that are listed in your bulletin. Please notice that next Sunday afternoon from 2 to 3, uh, we will gather in the loft for a discussion on kids and internet safety. So I hope you'll be a part of that event. We will share strategies and resources together. Registration for TBC Kids Day Camp is happening now. This is for kiddos who have finished K through second grade. Um, you can register online at www.trinitymadison.com. The Perry County Mission Trip is scheduled for later this summer. Um, this is a trip specially designed for families to take part in. Um, if your family is interested in being a part of this trip, uh, please see Glenn Bowers. I have an important announcement that there will not be a lunch meeting for the Perry County trip this afternoon. There was one scheduled, but we have postponed it. That group will meet again on July 6th. Please be in prayer for CBF this week. This week is the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship's annual gathering. We call it General Assembly. Several of our staff members will be traveling to Atlanta to be part of that gathering this week. Um, also, we have announcements about the picnic at the pastors. We are so excited that this afternoon we will gather again um, at the pastor's house. Miss Mary said that even if you haven't RSVP'd, you are welcome to attend, uh, but she may need a cooler of ice or two. So if you have a cooler you can fill with ice, that would be fantastic. At this time, I invite you to join me in standing for the passing of the peace. This morning in worship, we will focus our mind's attention and our heart's devotion on a God who walks beside us through the midst of any struggle. Welcome to worship at Trinity. morning. Would you pray with me, please? Father, it is, it is, is indeed good to be here in your house this morning. Father, we pray for your spirit here to just to move among us. I uplift all elements of this service, Father, to your glory. Thank you, Father, for uh, this church, and, and just continue to pray for this church and remember our staff as, as well. And Father, as always, just pray that you be with Mike as he brings your message to us. Prepare us, our hearts and our minds, for what you have for us this morning. Ask for these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let us now sing together our hymn of identity, hymn number 350, The Church's One Foundation. Please stand as we sing together.
Well, it's officially summer now, and many of you are planning or maybe have already gone on vacation. This past week, we spent a few days with my family, all 19 of us. It wasn't very quiet, but as I prepared for today, I'm just so grateful for the time that we had together. It's hard to get 19 people together at the same time. As you be still and know this morning, I hope that you remember the special summer events that your family and our church family is blessed with. Please pray with me. God, we thank you for the many people you have blessed us with in our families and in our church family. May we cherish the special moments we share together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Today I'll be reading Matthew 10, 26 through 39 uh, out of the NIV Bible. So do not be afraid of them. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your Father. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. May God bless the reading, hearing, and understanding of his word. At this time, our pre-K and kindergartners are invited to exit for children's worship as we sing together our hymn of unity, hymn number 388, Our God Has Made Us One. Please stand as we sing together.
Please be seated. Mars Hill College in the mountains of Western North Carolina has more than 1,250 students enrolled in both traditional and adult graduate studies. CBF endorsed Chaplain Stephanie McLeskey, along with the campus minister associate Deborah Alexander, oversees all aspects of religious life on campus, including community worship, campus ministries, service opportunities, both local and overseas, and spiritual formations, groups, and programs. The chaplain's office provides spiritual and emotional support for students as well as approximately 300 faculty and staff members. Prayers are asked for college for the college in the time of numerical growth and program e expansion for the students as their minds are open to new possibilities and for the chaplain's office staff members as they seek to serve Christ by serving this campus. Pray, pray that this community will be one that shares gener generously in the love of God. Please or pray with me in silent for a moment. Amen. Good morning. It's good to see you all today. I'm glad you're here for worship. I wanted to mention a couple of things. We're excited about our group of folks coming over to our house this afternoon. And uh, we have at least 90 that have already uh, told us that they're coming. And so Mary said, more the merrier. We'll take you all. Uh, you may want to carpool some of you because I'm hoping that we'll not get kicked out of our neighborhood association after this, <laughs> this little shindig today. 
But there is a, a Columbia Elementary School just right next to us, and we might want to park there and carpool over. There's also a little walking path you can walk uh, to our backyard if you'd like to from behind the school. Uh, we're excited about you coming over today. And uh, this is primarily for the younger families of our church and the kids. And I wanted to call your attention to the beautiful mosaics uh, behind me here. Don't they look really nice? Our children at the church did those. Uh, they completed that on one of the Wednesday night projects that they did. So if you see our kids and Amy, tell them thanks for that. I think it really adds to the beauty of our sanctuary and enhances our worship. Uh, think about all the things that that means there when you think about the roots of that tree and the, the faith that we develop here in church. I uh, also wanted to say just a word. Amy mentioned about the CBF meeting uh, coming up this week. I'm excited about that for us. As you know, uh, I've been serving on the Missions Council, and I'll be taking uh, my role as chair of the CBF Missions Council at our meeting. We're also introducing our new uh, Global Missions Coordinator, Stephen Porter. He has been a professor at uh, Baylor at Truett Seminary teaching evangelism and missions. And I'm very excited about that piece of the puzzle being complete as a full staffing now at CBF uh, will happen after this week. So I hope that you'll pray for us. Also, we'll come back Saturday night and then Sunday morning and a large group of us will be headed to Passport Youth Camp. So uh, all those, the youth, you'll see a bunch of them out. Uh, you won't see them, they won't be here, but they'll be leaving next Sunday. And I just say that to say, I hope that you'll pray for our youth. Passport is a great bonding time for them every year. It's a great opportunity for them to do mission work, to worship together and meet with several hundred other youth from around the country. Uh, we'll be gathering in Jacksonville, Florida this year. So pray for a safe trip and Teresa and all the chaperones who will be going on the trip. And I'm a, listed as a chaperone, but they may have to chaperone me a little bit too and watch out. I'm excited about all the things that are happening at Trinity. Well, we've been going through this series of family uh, sermons, and I threw this one in. We were really going to go from Mother's Day to Father's Day, and I sort of wanted to throw this one in. This is actually a passage in the Gospel of Matthew that we heard read earlier by Rinda that is part of the lectionary reading. So if some churches follow the lectionary, which is a series of readings that dates back to, to many, many years ago. And those readings come up and they have themes or whatever that happen. We're more familiar with Advent and Lent and Easter and those kinds of things. Uh, this is the Gospel of Matthew and it talks a little bit about family in a strange way. So I was thinking about that. I was reminded of a, of a favorite line that I've seen in a book, a series of books that I read some years ago about the legends and history of the British Isles. And in the, the book, the author was talking about different people who go on mission or, or journeys uh, during the founding of Britain and all the things that occurred in the history of Britain. And he had a line that he recurred in several of his books as people were going on these journeys. And the line was that they, they would stop periodically for sustenance for their journey, for their mission. And they usually didn't have a lot of stuff to eat, but they would have what he called a simple meal. And that's the line I liked a lot. A simple meal. I like that line, and it talks about the simple things that often sustain us for the mission of God in our lives and for the journeys that we all take in our lives. Our passage today is one of the things that Matthew collected for us, and it's one of the great speeches of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. He is about to send his 12 disciples out on a journey. They're going out on a mission to share the things about God with the people they encounter. And as they go, he lists stuff for them that reminds me of simple meal stuff. It's just simple things that he says to them. He says to them, don't take gold, don't take copper, don't take a bag with you. Just wear what you got on your back and go. And if you arrive at a place and they receive you, welcome that reception and let your peace abide there. If they reject you, no hard feelings, just shake the dust off your feet and go from that place. It's simple stuff. And it is stuff that the first Christian communities understood very acutely because they were living that kind of life, trying to make their way in something brand new that God had created called the church. They called it their family, this new family that God had created through His Son, Jesus. And this church family tried to make its way in very simple ways. They shared the things they had together. They fought together, they prayed together, they, they cared for people together, they tried to take care of each other and all the things that they faced. And what Jesus was doing, and in this passage I think particularly, is talking about something these early Christians knew a lot about. And it was just simple dependency on God. Simple, honest dependency on God. They didn't have a lot of things. They just had each other. And they had faith. And they had a belief that God had sent them on a mission on a journey in life. This is one of the five great speeches that Jesus gives in the Gospel of Matthew. Now Matthew is not the oldest of our Gospels, 
but it is listed first in our readings. When we open the New Testament, that's our first gospel because it was probably the favorite gospel of the early church. Some people have called it a handbook, and it was used by the early church as a way for them to figure out this new family, this new thing called church. How do we live life together, and how do we fulfill the call of God as we do church together? And so they like Matthew a lot. Other people point out that Matthew was written particularly with a group of people in mind. These first Christians, many of them came from this area of Jewish culture and faith, and they had converted from that to follow Jesus as their Messiah, as their Lord, as their Savior. And so as they did this, this group was very aware of Jewish customs, rules, and religion, and faith. And Matthew takes all that as an assumption when he's writing his gospel that we would all know about Jewish culture and Jewish traditions and Jewish faith. And he talks so much about how Jesus is the fulfillment of all the hopes and dreams and the faith of all those years of Jewish people throughout the Old Testament and beyond. And one of the great messages of Matthew then for this group of early Christians who are coming out of that culture and then creating something brand new called the church, the family of God, they are getting instructions in their handbook of Matthew and Matthew's sending them some very important messages. And one of the messages he sends is, is that Jesus, the one they're staking their lives on, is the greatest to ever live. He's the greatest of anyone you could ever imagine. And for Jewish Christians, they were imagining one person in particular because they had been taught all their lives that this was the greatest person who'd ever lived. His name was Moses. He was at our vacation Bible school recently. Moses is the one who gave the law to the people, God's Word, and established the, the people, the chosen people of God, and the, led them through the wilderness and out of the great exodus of Egypt and all those kinds of things. You know about Moses. So the people who came to Christ early on were these Jewish people who knew all about Moses and had taught all their lives that he was the greatest to ever live, the greatest teacher to ever be. And this was their family tradition. It was important that they stayed strong in unity in that culture. And here came Christ and these disciples, and they break from their family values. They break away from their family traditions. And they're creating something brand new that we know as the church. And Matthew is their handbook. And they're getting encouraging words because some of them, when they break from their culture and their family traditions, are breaking away in such a way that it causes conflict for them. It causes pressures on their lives. And so they get these encouraging words. Some of them have been kicked out of the synagogues. Some of them have been hurt by their own biological families because of the divisions that are occurring there. And these groups of early Christians, as many as you know, were persecuted at many turns. So they're facing all of these things. And some of them begin to think, is it worth breaking away from all of that to follow this new family this new Messiah that we have, this person we know is Jesus. And Matthew says it is. It is worth putting Jesus above all other priorities that we have in life. And so Matthew encourages them by telling them about how Jesus is really the greatest of the greats. So they're thinking about Moses. And Matthew puts it in such a way that Jewish Christians are going to automatically see the parallels. So for example, Jesus goes up on a mountain and shares one of the great speeches we know as the Sermon on the Mount. He tells us about his vision. It's an incredible vision of the kingdom of God. And Jewish Christians are thinking, I remember the stories of Moses going up on the mountain and receiving the words of God that become the law for us, the Torah, the words of what we use to shape our communities and our lives and our culture today and our faith. The difference is, though, that Matthew points out is when Moses went up the mountain, he got the words from God, God wrote it down, and Moses reported what God said. When Jesus goes on the mountain, Jesus says, you've heard it said, but I say unto you. It's a very important thing that, Moses, or that Matthew's telling them. Matthew's telling them that Moses, as great as he is in all your history and everything you've always learned since you were a kid, is wonderful, but Jesus is greater than that. Moses reported what God said, Jesus is God. Jesus doesn't write down a report from the Father. Jesus speaks, and His words are the words of God in their completeness. You remember, Jesus said, I didn't come to do away with the law. I have come to bring a completeness to it. 
So these early Christians who were breaking away and having conflict, even when in their bio biological families, are encouraged by what they're hearing because they're staking their lives, sometimes at great risk, even to their bodily living, because they've decided to follow Jesus. And they're getting these words from Matthew. And the people who listened to Jesus, Matthew reports, were amazed at the authority that he gave. And it's not just that. Throughout Matthew, Matthew groups Jesus on all these great words of his into five great speeches. And these early Jewish Christians are going to remember, hey, Moses had the five books of the law too. We call it the Pentateuch, the first five books of our Old Testament. And those are the, the foundation of Jewish life and faith for these early Christians who've now left that behind and are building on that and accepting Jesus as the Messiah. And Matthew is presenting one who has a parallel with five great speeches where Jesus says, I'm not getting this as a report for you from someone like God. I am God. I'm reporting to you exactly with my words and His words become Scripture from them. I'll be honest with you, it's a little hard for us maybe to get the dramatic hope and encouragement that these early Christians who were persecuted, sometimes by their own families, who faced conflict because they chose to put Jesus as their first and most important priority in life. They had to live with that. And they were staking their futures and their destinies on it. And creating a new family where they joined together in something they call the church. And they start calling each other brothers and sisters, this new family. And because of that, they have all this pressure on them. Pressure from society, pressure from the economy. Some of them lose their jobs because of this. Some of them lose their livelihood. Some of them have the pressures of political changes. All the things that you and I sometimes experience today, they're having that happen simply because they've chosen to put Christ as the most important thing in their lives. And Matthew's words become incredibly important to them. It's why it's the first gospel. He tells them that it's worth it. He tells them that Jesus is indeed the greatest of all. He is the greatest teacher. He's greater than Moses. He is the Son of God. So here comes Matthew 10, one of the great five speeches of Jesus. And in Matthew 10, Jesus is getting His students, His disciples ready to go away and try out their hand at doing the work of God in the world, sharing about God, doing mission work, if you will. And as they go, he gives them a great gift, these words of encouragement and of truth-telling. It's a gift from Matthew that he collected for this early church, but it's also a gift for you and me too. They're going to face these same kind of things in life that you and I face. Things about the economic insecurities that we wonder about, political changes, society and its values and the things we had to pray about and think about, and they're facing the same things. This is not just history book stuff. This is stuff that Matthew gave not only to the folks at the beginning of Christianity, it's stuff Matthew gives to you and me today. And to be honest, we cringe at it a little bit, don't we? When Renda was reading it earlier, I leaned over to Amy and I said, well, that's a great passage for me today, isn't it? I like part of it, don't you? His eyes on the sparrow. But I've been doing all this family stuff, and at the end of it, your daughter-in-laws don't like you. That's not a good thing, is it? Why Jesus talk about death and hell in the midst of this beautiful words about his eye being on the sparrow? Why Jesus talk about division within families? Why Jesus talk about persecution and hurt, sword? Why talk about tribunals where people are given the opportunity to say where they stand? One way or another, which team are you really on? Why all of this? Well, I think it's because Jesus has always been a truth teller. Jesus is telling these early Christians, and Matthew is telling us today the truth about our lives. Matthew sets it all down for the church. And before Jesus sends them out as sheep among wolves, he says, before he sends us out on a mission, he talks about fear. Because if you're going to be this kind of person, there will be threats to you. If you go along with everybody, there will be no threats. But if you make a stand and try to live for Christ and put Him first in your life, there will be threats to your life and to your family. So it's going to cause some fear for you. I want you to think about what makes you afraid today. What are the fears that you have in your life? 
In the Harry Potter books, we are told that if you won't name your fears, you give them even more power than they actually have. So try to name what you fear. Well, I don't know about you, whether you name it or not, there are fears that we have in our lives that are just hard to shake, aren't they? They're hard for us to get over because they embrace us. Fear has an ability to capture us. So what are you afraid of? And what are your fears? I have a book published by Smith & Hellways that does some of our Sunday school literature. And the title of the book is, Does Your Child's World Scare You? And my answer is, yes, sometimes it does. It scares me a lot. What scares you? What are you afraid of? I have a fear of heights, for example. I do not like going into tall buildings and leaning over the ledge of that railing. If they get me out there, I grip it very tightly. My boys are smiling because they know. And I start perspiring just a little bit, and I, I have this macabre desire to look over the edge, but to hold myself back, too. I don't like heights very well. I'm afraid of those. When I was younger, my granddaddy loaded my brother and me up in the truck, and we drove to Gadsden, where they were opening a new Jack's restaurant. I've always liked Jack's. And they were opening the new restaurant. It wasn't quite open yet, but there was a big sign out front that said, Now Hiring. And so my granddaddy took us and thought it'd be a good idea for us to think about having a little summer job. So we go there, and as the sign's out front, and they're still working on the building, but people are going in applying for the jobs, you can get a little sheet of paper and fill it out about yourself and go in and turn in your application, and then they'll call you back. Well, I honestly was so scared back in those days of doing stuff like that that when we got there, my stomach started hurting me so bad. It really hurt a lot. And, and my brother went in and turned my application in for me at Jack's. I never got a call back. I don't know why. <laughs> it was hard for me to go into new places like that, even though for a while I sold grit newspaper in my little neighborhood in Hoax Bluff. I, at one time, I was paralyzed by fear of getting up in front of a church group and speaking, which is sort of funny to me today. I was also very fearful of asking a girl out on a date. I was afraid of several things. One is that back in those days, you'd call them up on the telephone that you dialed. And so I was afraid after the last dial went around that she'd answer the phone, number one. So that was my first fear. The second fear was that she'd say, yes, I'll go out with you on a date. And then what? Well, luckily I got over that in college. My brother sells home security systems. And he just started this new job. So he called me the other day and said, I want to practice my speech on you. And so he tells me about home security systems and all the things they can do to secure your family and keep you protected. You know, Mary could even get a little thing if somebody follows her home from the mall or something and she's in the front of the house and she sees a car behind her, she can hit the button and it sets the alarms off and calls the police. It's a lot of neat stuff. But then it made me think about all the stuff, you know, that this security system is supposed to protect us from in the world. And it sort of scares me a little bit, it makes me afraid. When we first built our house in Williams, we, we were in a fairly new subdivision. There were all these woods behind our house. And we had just moved in. And for whatever reason, Mary and the boys were, I think, maybe visiting her mama and they were gone. So I'm spending the night, one of the first nights in this new house that we built. We didn't have it really all furnished. It had the bed set up. But there were no curtains and no shades on the windows. So I'm, I'm lying in bed and there's these woods behind me and there's these two windows right behind me and there's no curtains or no shades. And it's, you know, I'm a guy, I'm, I'm tough. But I decided to read a Dean Koontz novel. <laughs> Y'all read those too. And this, this one was about some kind of experimental thing that went on at this research facility. And these things escaped and they came out of the woods into this guy's house at night. <laughs> so I'll be really honest with you. I was, I was at a fearful night with all those new noises and there's you know, the darkness and who's looking in the window at me? What makes you afraid? What are your fears in life? My fears are different now than they were when I was a teenager. I fear some of the same things you fear in your life today. I fear what the world would be like and how it will treat my children. I fear the kind of relationships they will get into and how they'll be valued and loved and find their place in the world. I fear about the ways the economy will impact my life directly and our church as well. I fear about the changing values that shifts so much and seems so fastly to change in our world today and how I must pray about that and think about those constantly. I have a list of fears, and I bet you have a list of fears too. Well, Jesus was telling us the truth in this passage. This beautiful passage where his eyes on the sparrow, Jesus tells us the truth. It is not easy 
to live. And if you choose to stake your life on Christ, it will not be easy to do that either. Those values will often go against the grain of the values of the world you live in, he says. And it was directly experienced by these first Christians. We are more connected to Jesus than maybe we thought. We're not just connected to Him by His love and His grace and mercy and all those good things. We're connected because what happens to the Master, he says, will probably happen to the servants because the servants aren't greater than the Master. So if they persecuted me, be aware you may be persecuted. If the world was hard on me, be aware it may be hard and difficult on you. We are like Him. So Jesus says it truthfully and honestly. Struggles will come. Diseases will hit you. Hard times and confusions will come your way, and sometimes you won't be able to sleep well at night because your fears will almost overwhelm you. Jesus told us the truth. Don't think that's strange stuff if you have those fears. It is common to everyone. Our world can be scary, and all of us have to face those fears one way or another in this life. And it's even true that being a follower of Christ, that will not make you immune from fearful things. It will not keep you from the things that scare you and scare you about your families in this world. And to be honest, there are some families that are the cause of fear in our world. When I was a kid, I would visit on the alternate weekends when my dad had custody of us, I would go and visit with my grandmother often in Gadsden to stay with her, which from Hoax Bluff to Gadsden was like town. This was a big place for us. So we, we found a group of guys one day in this little town of Gadsden in a vacant lot, and we played football. And it was a great day. And after it was over with, I noticed one of the boys that was with this group was a guy they call Cotton. Cotton, to me, looked completely white. His hair was white. He was the whitest guy I had ever seen in my life. They called him Cotton, and so we did too. And I liked Cotton. We played that day, but I noticed he was quiet and a little shy. And after the day was over, as we began to leave, I noticed one of his brothers hitting him and saying, Cotton, come on, let's go home. And I now know that Cotton was abused. His brothers abused him. And they learned how to do that at their home, in their families. They learned to do that at home. And Jesus says, sometimes following God is hard, and sometimes the values of my new family will go against the values of your biological families. And then... In the midst of all of that, and all this talk about fear, he says those beautiful words. It is true, there are things that will make you afraid in this world, and it will not be easy for you to live. It will not be easy for you to have faith. But remember God. And remember that God is watching over you. God is with you. God will never abandon you. Remember, God even watches the sparrow, and the sparrow is only worth a penny. And how much more value are you to God? Remember that all the hairs on your head are numbered. And you know, we make a lot of jokes about that. I, I know that when I was younger, God had a lot more counting to do with me than he does now. And as I get older, the, the count will be lower and lower. But we know it's not really about that, is it? It's about God embracing all of us in a very intimate way. He has the very hairs of your head numbered, whether it's 10,000, 1,000, or zero. God has you always in His view. Jesus says in the midst of His discussion about truth and fear and the difficulties of following Him in the world, that God embraces you, embraces your children wherever they go and whatever they do. Imagine the encouragement that these early Christians received from that. Jesus tells them the truth. Life is not always fair, and it won't always be easy. Even faith will be difficult for you. And so Jesus encourages them with this beautiful picture of God who embraces us in an intimate way. And then he talks about family. Jesus gives new definition to family. Jesus' family values are found in his church family where people care about each other. They learn to live in the diversity that is God's family. They learn to call each other brothers and sisters where the blood of Christ is the only thing thicker than water. In the church family. In the church, Jesus says, 
you have the possibility of finding home. A home where they have to take you in. A home where you always belong no matter what your background has been. A home where you come and you must be accepted no matter what mistakes you've made in life. It is simple stuff, really, isn't it? The truth is life is hard. But the truth is also that God has His eyes on you and on your family in an intimate way. God is the most awful thing, the most amazing being ever. And He gives us this new family. We belong here. This is God's family. It's simple stuff. And for whatever reason, it was enough for these early Christians to live on. And I submit to you today, it is still enough. Is it for you? The truth is, life's hard. God will not abandon you in it. And God has gifted us with family. It's simple stuff. It's about dependency on God and God's people. And I think it's still enough to build a life on, to have a family on. May it be so for all of us. Amen. Hello, I'm Mike Oliver. I'm the senior pastor here at Trinity Baptist Church. I'd like to thank you for joining us for worship through our church website. And also, I'd like to invite you to come and visit us. This is a great church. We have friendly people here. We value worship. We value community and global missions. And there are programs for children all the way to senior adults. I think you'll like our church, and I hope you'll come and visit us and see for yourself in person. If you have questions about our church, like to know more, we'd love for you to contact us. There's information on our website. You can call us or email us or come by, and one of our staff members will be glad to talk with you. Welcome to Trinity, and God bless you and keep you.